everyone's awake after some great parties last night. Um, how many of you like to lose money on transferring money somewhere else? Raise your hands. Excellent. Well, I'm delighted to be next to Christo, um, one of the founders that I've had the privilege to work with over the years in Seed Camp. And I want to share with you his story. And all good stories begin with, uh, with a very sort of dramatic uh, origin story. And in this case, how many of you here are solo founders? Founders, one guy, Dan Gandesha, I see him there, and a few others. Um, Christo started in the same, in the same light. Uh, so maybe, Christo, you can share with us kind of the early challenges of not only being a solo founder, but also in attracting a team uh, to help build what is now TransferWise. Yeah, so good to see everyone. I'm surprised you, you don't party hard. Like, what is it? It's 10 o'clock and you're already here. But um, so being a solo founder, sorry, back to the topic, it's... Uh, it's um, it's, it's quite hard, so I wouldn't kind of recommend it to everyone. Uh, but I also wouldn't recommend to stress about it. So I think one of the big things about being a founder and especially meeting the people who are starting up now, I think the, the, kind of the biggest advice that I would start with, especially early days, don't stress about things. So don't stress about having, not having a co-founder. Uh, yeah, it's good to have a co-founder, but don't stress about it if you don't. Uh, you'll find people you'd love to work with, and eventually, if you're doing the right thing, they're going to join you. If you don't have engineers to work with, you'll, you'll find some engineers, and if you enjoy working with them, they will join you. So I think that's the, that's the kind of the, the good approach that, uh, that I was kind of lucky to, lucky to take. And uh, although, as Carlos said, kind of starting alone in the, in the beginning, you know, quite quickly, there's, uh, there's actually a team around me and, and working on the same thing. So, and how did you how did you motivate that team around this idea of of money transfers? Because in some ways now we look at it, and it, of course it's an obvious big thing. But back then people might have said, "Hey, look, I don't know if I want to compete against Western Union." What and what was the reaction? Not only early investors that you were talking to, but also to early customers around like, "I, I don't. I, this seems like such a small thing." Or, or was it so obvious, so big back then? So let me tell you about early customers. Um, I built the first website, um, and then I tried to convince about 30 of my friends to use it. I think only five ended up using them, uh, using it with qu quite a lot of uh, quite a, lo a lot of pressure. And, um, and I had actually no expectation whether with the customers or whether people are going to use the website. So when we launched with a blog on, on TechCrunch in early January 2011, you know, we really didn't know what to expect. Um, and, and I think that's, that's where the kind of the aha moment was when you put the product out there. You know, the, everyone tells you that. You have, just have to put the product out there uh, and then you'll know. So put it, put, put it out there, 15 minutes later, someone sends us 2,000 uh, pounds to be sent to France. 2,000, I mean, that's a big leap of faith. But that leap of faith just didn't necessarily just extend to customers. You also needed to start working with banks and the local infrastructure to be able to enable this. Tell us about those early, because I think a, a lot of the, the people's questions might be around, how do you make that bridge into interfacing with legacy systems, legacy banks, institutions, and then create innovation on top of that? That's a very good question. So I think it's incredible, it's probably the same in all industries, but it's inc incredibly hard in, in banking because the infrastructure is not very good. Um, and you, and, and not, not only is it good, but it's very localized. So you have this infrastructure in, the UK and you, you have this infrastructure in the US and they're totally different. So that's why I don't think that we've had a, like a global fintech company since, since PayPal. And now maybe Stripe and Agen are, are getting there, but it's incredibly hard for them. So you're right, how do you do it? I think, uh, again, you, you, can't, you can't kind of figure it out from A to Z. You just need to go one by one. So what we did, we launched with Pound and Euro. We had a bank account in Ireland first and in, in London. And we were able to transfer money from euros to pounds and pounds to euros. That's all we needed. That's, that was the MVP that we launched. Um, and now we're in like 400 currency routes. And the only way we got there is month by month by month, just adding more routes, uh, convincing more banks to work, uh, work with us, getting more licenses, etc. So you just take it step by step. It's just, you need to be very clever what your MVP is going to be. So what, what one tip would you give to founders here who are doing that step by step in negotiating in position of weakness effectively against big players who, you, who kind of maybe know or are waking up to the fact that you're about to disrupt them? 
I think, again, it's very hard to give advice because I don't think we, uh, we had this problem uh, for, for, for a while. You know, banks didn't really take us as, uh, as competitors. Yeah. And you know, they, they barely recognized, I mean, only the smarter ones recognized us as you know, something similar to Western Union. And they were used to working with Western Union, so they kind of put us in the same bucket. So I think maybe the advice could be you know, find a, a kind of equivalent that you can sell yourself as, even if you're not. But, but for that bigger partner, you, know, you have to come up with a story that you know, we're a new version of X. Um, and so that they can they can know how to work with you, especially yes. with big organizations like banks, who just have to kind of tell the story of, of who you are. Yeah. So we'll we'll come back to the subject of banks in a few minutes, but let's jump now to sort of investment and and getting investment. Uh, Seedcamp, we're privileged to have been one of your earliest investors, um, but you know the, you've had many many conversations over the years and. What was the process that you went through in selecting investors to work with? If, you want to, if you're a solo founder and you want to figure out how to negotiate with VCs, you should start with Carlos. That's the, that was the best one. So that was, that was my first negotiation. Like getting, uh, getting the investment terms from Carlos was, was probably the first negotiation. That uh, taught me quite a lot for the, for the, for the next years to come. Um, it was fun. We, uh, we, we, we were in 2011. We bootstrapped for the first year. So... People don't do this nowadays, but I think we were super lucky because we had a product, and we were live, we had thousands of customers by the time we took Seedcamp's money, uh, which wasn't a lot, unfortunately. And then once we started figuring out that you know, we can't go for much longer, we were running out of our bank accounts, then I think a year in, we started, uh, and post-Seedcamp, post we started talking to the European VCs. We were based in London. Um, we talked a lot, but uh, no, one, no one took the bait. So uh, quite luckily for us, uh, IA Ventures and uh, Roger Ehrenberg in, in, in New York invited us, in, in us over for a, for a Friday. Uh, we went, we had lunch, and uh, next Monday there was a term sheet. And we were like stunned, so we spent two months in Europe you know, speaking with every VC that lives in London, and then all of a sudden they just take a lunch with someone in, in New York. But a, a lot of that comes down to also having a strong brand as a startup. And uh, for those of you that have seen some of the brand uh, advertising that Transferize makes, it involves, in some cases, some outlandish nudity, in some cases, heavy industry trucks, and uh, lastly, I saw a Spider-Man up a wall. <laughs> what, was, what was the origin behind your branding strategy and, and approaching things in such a fresh way and, and how, you know, surely you, you probably had some hiccups along the way. Oh, yes, definitely. So talk about transfers marketing and, and marketing in general. So neither me nor my co-founder were really marketeers. Um, but I think we've learned to do this in a very kind of rational way, which is just to understand what is the problem that we're solving with marketing. Um, you hear all the kind of the, the brand, uh, brand people talking about you know, buzzwords, etc. But really, the problem that we're solving for us is getting people understand that they're being ripped off. So when you send five thousand uh, pounds abroad, you know the bank secretly takes tells you that the cost is fifteen pounds, but they secretly take two hundred in the exchange rate. So once people get that, it's incredibly easy. It's it's like trivial. They they use your product. Uh, so the hardest part is, is, is how to get people to understand that they're being you know, slightly ripped off and, and how to do it in a fun way that it's, it's engaging. So, so that's, uh, that's where the kind of the thinking process started. But, uh, engaging, but engaging people on something that's fun is surely not the same here as it is in Japan where cultures vary. And not only cultures in terms of branding, but also in terms of partnerships and, and customer acquisition across different. So how have you dealt with that internationalization challenge? We're still, we're still doing it. And I was spending time in, in the US last week speaking with uh, customers and people there, also talking about our advertising and branding. And what I found out that actually in the States, people don't like to be proven wrong. So they don't like this idea that, okay, those uh, funny guys are telling them how they're being you know, silly and being ripped off. I think in the UK, you know, after this PPI scandal, we, you know, we expect the banks to kind of screw us a little bit. 
Uh, but in the US, they don't like. So we actually have to figure out a kind of different approach and different messaging for, for US. Yeah. And I'm sure once we reach Japan, that's going to be super interesting. But and how has that, from the sort of operations point of view, affected you? How does in internationalization, from an operations point of view, in terms of scaling your team, like running a US operation, how, how has that worked? So that's a good question. Um, when you start, I'm sure your accelerators uh, and, uh, and mentors are telling you that, hey, doing a startup is throwing spaghetti on the wall. And I think I'm only now starting to really understand what that means. So all the time, we're actually operating this way, that we you know, open things up and we see what sticks. So we, we do a lot of, kind of, we open up the product and we listen to customers, like, what are they, what are they telling us? The best thing is, when they, uh, uh, when they invite other people, we had something on the website where you can type in a message to a friend, like why they should use TransferWise. So reading this was the most illuminating thing of the whole, of the whole time with TransferWise. What do people say when they recommend your product to, to their friend? And that's kind of, kind of defined the, the whole marketing thing. So when you ask international, again, we're 400 routes, the way that it works is can we open up as much as we can? We don't know which route is going to be big. So there's loads of Tur Turkish people living in uh, London and in, um, in Germany. We've had barely any traffic on that route. But then again, you have, uh, I didn't know that, uh, that there are so many Hungarians, like we probably have a, a massive market share in Hungary. Like what is different between Turkey and Hungary? Honestly, I don't know, but I know that there is something that makes Hungarian people use transferwise, and that's where you invest when you internationalize. So you start with things that actually stick, so you don't come up with a strategy, hmm, I'd like to reach you know, affluent 50-year-old people, housewives. Mm. No, you don't do that. You don't strategize. You actually do things, see what sticks, and then you amplify. Mm. And on that amplification, um, growth of this sort requires staff and lots of inflection points in staff growth. What would have been the major inflection points for TransferWise in terms of people? 50, 100? Um, what, what have been the challenges there? <laughs> it's happened so quickly that I've uh, kind of hard to know what the inflection point was. Uh, you know, we went, we doubled every six months uh, headcount. We're now over 400 people, and uh, and people's interesting. So, of course, as a founder, that's where I spend about 90% of my time is is hiring people and you know getting them behind the mission and getting us all you know, really productive in, in figuring this out. And um, there's this kind of philosophy that's evolved for me is, you know, I'm not, I don't think that I'm a, a great grand marshal that I can say like 400 people behind me and then I'm gonna lead them into the battle. No, not at all, but I think uh, 400, if you get 400 really smart people, they can figure out themselves how to, how to win the battle. So the way that we operate in TransferWise is, is very much figuring out what are the independent units that can you know, solve parts of our mission or part of our strategy. So if the strategy is that people want money to move really fast across borders, we have a speed team. So we have a team that is totally full stack. Their only job, their only KPI is to figure out how to make money move in 17 seconds between any country. Mm. Yeah. And to wrap things up, um, one of the things that a lot of companies are told is to focus, to focus on their product, to, to target one, one group that's really passionate about it. You guys have been focusing on FX and, and enabling that for a large portion of the world. There's probably a lot more of the world that, that could use your product. But what are your thoughts on being a single product company, on, on perhaps staying that way or, or expanding beyond that? And, um, and that's, that's quite hard. It's, for me, it's been very, very hard to, to fight because it's so very naturally people get excited about new products. Three months in, my friends asked me, hey, you're still working on transfers, but you solved this already, right? So you built the, you built the thing, like, what are you doing? Um, and then you, you read the things like McKinsey report that says that banks take $300 billion every year for moving their customers' money around the world, and they realize that, okay, I've solved like half a percent of this problem. And that, you just have to be really rational about this is a huge problem to solve. So we know how to solve it, or we have an idea how to solve it. Let's solve the damn problem and not, let's not get distracted about 
you know, everything else and all the other opportunities that are out there. Because once you solve the problem, the other opportunities are only getting bigger. And that's what we're seeing over the years. Yeah, and do you feel that, that, that there's investor pressure on that? Or, or is it pretty much like, yes, you could stick to this and... That's why you, that's why you choose smart investors. Right. Yeah. And, and that's why I think the, the smart investors get that. They, uh, uh, you know, they, they see the, the traction and the growth yeah. and that's, that's important. And they also, they've seen enough, at least our investors have seen enough that you know, the better you get at solving this one problem, yeah. the bigger all the other opportunities are going to be. Cool. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, Christo. Thanks, everyone, and for thanks, waking guys. up.